Hi, hello and welcome to the second series on the Masks of Commedia dell'Arte. In uh, this series you will find uh, more information about the historical contextualization of Commedia dell'Arte, so some background information that are a complement to the previous series that you can find on the channel uh, that focused on the physical approach to the Masks of Commedia dell'Arte. So while that one was a way for you to experiment of how the masks move, how they walk, and so to the physical characterization here, we will have the opportunity to understand a bit better the context, uh, both the historical period, uh, the main features of Commedia dell'arte, why Commedia dell'arte is relevant today, and a bit about each mask, the background of each mask, so where these characters uh, come from, what was the, what was that, uh, let's say, inspired the Commedianti, the actors of Commedia dell'arte, to create uh, these, uh, these characters and tell us the, their stories. I hope you will enjoy it and I leave you to uh, the, this uh, introduction and the next sessions. I want to start with a quote from one of the major and the most prominent commedianti, that is the actors of Commedia dell'arte, of the time, of the golden age of Commedia, Flaminio Scala, who tells us that gestures can be more powerful than words. I leave you to reflect on that, but certainly there are so many um, connection we can make with this sentence <laughs> and a lot of contemporary performance uh, practices and approaches to theatre making. Think about the wide uh, world of uh, what we call physical theatre, the notion of body as a medium of expression and the different and the various uh, exploration in, in contemporary devised performance. But what is Commedia dell'arte. Well, Commedia is a, a complex uh, theatrical phenomenon that originated in Italy in the 16th century. It flourished throughout Europe for a century and changed and adapted to the demands and the taste of different audiences in different places and in different historical periods. Because Commedia, or at least the golden age of Commedia, uh, is considered approximately, it lasted for approximately 200 years, which is a, a quite a long period of time, so we can assume that uh, Commedia changed through time, not only in the different places, but also through time in the different uh, uh, centuries. Often, Commedia dell'arte is described as a popular form of outdoor street theatre based on improvisation between masked characters. This is partly true, but not accurate. This definition is a bit too superficial to explain the complexity of Commedia dell'arte, its longevity and the massive impact it had on the development of European theatre. And I mention this because Commedia is not only an outdoor form of theatre, it's not only based on improvisation and is not only masked. And we're going to see each of these elements. First of all, Commedia is... Um, in, with Commedia dell'arte, uh, we have a merging, a meeting of popular culture and high culture. I would say that it's uh, um, what I describe as a fertile and exciting moment of reconciliation between opposites. In a sense, um, yes, the popular tradition and orality is incredibly important. So we are talking about mimes, storytellers, clowns, acrobats, street performers but also literature, so all the rich tradition that come from ancient Rome, the common in ancient Rome, Renaissance, comedies and written plays have a major impact in the development of Commedia dell'arte. And this is because Commedia is a product of a very specific historical period, the Renaissance. And in this period, the influence of humanism in, uh, in the study of, uh, of theatre cannot be denied. This is a moment where the concept conceptualization, the, the definition of what is comedy broaden and it goes beyond written play. It embraced also other form of theatre. So in a sense, we have a two-way uh, a dialogue and a two-way uh, cross-fertilization between orality and the popular tradition, popular com comedy and tradition of theatre 
And on the other hand, we have also the influence from what is considered, what is labeled high culture, so the written culture that influence this pop popular um, performances. Commedia dell'arte is exactly the um, this uh, the result of this. In a, in a sense, is the um, best uh, I would say example. And representation of the meeting of these two cultures, like seeing two rivers that merge and they create a big, powerful new river. Let's see what are Commedia dell'arte main features that uh, represents, uh, represent this uh, merging of two rivers, merging of two cultures. First of all, Commedia was performed both indoor and outdoor, so it's a misconception to believe that Commedia was performed only in street and piazzas in squares. Commedia was masked and unmasked. We know, we can see from the scenarios that there are masked characters and unmasked characters. It utilized linear narrative as well as, epi as episodic narrative. Commedia has a simple structure, in a sense, the scenarios of Commedia has the traditional structure in three acts often with a prologue and an epilogue, and also uh, moments that are completely um, self-contained, independent. Those are the Lazzi, and there are many Lazzi <laughs> throughout uh, a performance of Commedia del Latte. Commedia was uh, both written and improvised. This is another element uh, that uh, often um, I find improvisation and the importance given to improvisation is a bit... Um, misunderstood, I find, uh, um, nowadays when we talk about Commedia dell'arte. It's undeniable that the performers of Commedia were really skilled in taking advantage of the moment and improvise with the audience and adapting to the specific situation, so the specific country, the specific poli socio-political uh, uh, situation, and they had to be able to adapt to this, uh, different, the different places and demands of uh, the audiences. However, we also have uh, um, documentation that uh, uh, prove that uh, Comedianti were working a lot with written materials, uh, written material of various kinds, dialogues, soliloquies, poetry, uh, speeches of different kinds. So we know for certain that there was a big element of Commedia that was written and was rehearsed, so the actors knew it very well. So it was a heavy improvisation, yes, within a very solid structure. And we will discuss that again a bit later on in depth. Commedia integrates both poetry and obscenity. So on one hand, from the tradition of from liter literature, it integrates um, lyrical moments and poetic moments, especially in the dialogues of the lovers, but also obscenities and other elements uh, present in the performances of Commedia dell'arte. Let's see now what are the uh, performative qualities that are particularly relevant to contemporary performance. For me, the most important aspect is the notion of actors as creators. So this is an actor's theatre. The actors are, uh, they create the characters, they bring the specific skills shaping this character, shaping the relationship between characters and therefore the scenarios. So the actors are uh, creators is an ensemble, the ensemble collaborative process, so that is an um, important aspect that we recognize in uh, contemporary performance, especially in practices like device theatre. Improvisation, as I said, is very important, doesn't have to be overestimated, but it's significantly important in Commedia dell'arte and playfulness. The body as a medium of expression, and then we go back to Flaminia Scala quotes, that gestures can be more powerful than words. Um, obviously, uh, in Commedia, there is a curiosity and a, and a deep exploration of the grotesque and the absurd. And a very important aspect of Commedia is audience, the audience interaction. The notion of a fourth wall didn't exist. So everything was performed for and with, in a sense, with the audience. And we, you will see, if you go and look at the practical videos on Commedia dell'arte, um, I mention a very important, um, uh, a very important technique called il colpo di maschera, uh, and the, so the clocking. And clocking implies also clocking the audience and making a clear 
a relation, a clear, clear connection, clear eye contact with your audience, and, and this is always this channel is always open, always performed for and with your audience. And the rich uh, richness of comedy is also in a mixing of codes, of stylist, the stylistic promiscuity, the integration of parody, of satire, of irony. So this comes obviously from this rich tradition of uh, uh, popular culture, this uh, openness to um, integration of many different stylistic codes. And as I mentioned before, we have this uh, also strong um, influence of literature or poetry or written plays that brings different registers as well. Uh, and interdisciplinarity, uh, Commedia uh, utilizes uh, dances, my music, singing, really the actors were e extremely versatile, great actors in terms of ability, their physical abilities, great actors because of the use of words, of text, of the uh, flexibility and their ability to perform in different places with different languages, different accents, different dialects. Um, and also, uh, often they were, well, writers themselves, but also musicians and singers and dancers. Now, the name, Commedia dell'arte. The name Commedia dell'arte actually was, uh, wasn't <laughs> utilized during the 16th and 17th century is a, a, a name, is a late invention attributed to Carlo Goldoni, a prominent and very important playwright. In the, in this, we're talking about the 18th century. And Goldoni employed it to distinguish the masked improvised comedy, so commedia, from the scripted comedy. During the, um, the time, the golden age of Commedia dell'arte, uh, the most frequent terms were Commedia degli Zanni, Commedia all'improvvisa, Commedia delle Maschere, or Commedia Mercenaria. These are descriptive terms, obviously, the Zanni refers to some of the main characters, all'improvvisa means improvised, so make reference to the fact that it is not a written play but the actor's work of a structure that is called a scenario commedia delle maschere because uh, one of the features is the use of masked characters and commedia mercenaria that means mercenary commedia however having said that although these are all terms that are valid to define commedia dell'arte most scholar and practitioner today consider the term del commedia dell'arte the most accurate obviously commedia stands for comedy and uh, the second part dell'arte uh, identifies uh, a very specific uh, feature of um, the theater at that time it's the creation of the companies Commedia dell'arte means uh, comedy performed by professional actors. To distinguish it from theater performed by courtly, courtly amateurs, the word arte stands for association of professionals, guild or a union. Arti e mestieri, in Italian back then, was the name given to guilds of professionals. Arte stands for craft or knowledge and mestiere for profession. Here I'm going to quote uh, Antonio Fava, who says that Commedia dell'arte identifies perhaps the most historically significant aspect of the invention, professionalism. At its birth, commedia was above all a practical idea, a theatrical spectacle fashioned to be sold to make a profit capable of sustaining the artist and finances and financing further artistic projects. So, hence the mercenary art, an art that is sold to make money, to carry on working as actors as well as supporting uh, their families. Now, let's have a look at the troops of Commedia dell'arte. When we talk of early professional performers, um, it is important to recognize, and here I'm going to quote uh, Kenneth Richards, it's important to recognize that there was a really vast range and variety of Italian players and professional theater, uh, and professional theater activities in the 16th and 17th century. This means that uh, we, we, we know that there were both companies closely associated with courts, 
distinguished independent traveling companies, as well as less in t- lesser itinerant troops of various size and possibly even small groups of just two or three performers. So it's a kind of wide range from the most popular, famous and well supported by uh, the patronage of the aristocracy to small uh, um, performers that were trying to make a living moving from piazza to piazza when they could, <laughs> obviously. Obviously, <laughs> We don't have a video recording of that time, but we have some written documentation and pictorial uh, documentation of the time. But obviously most of the information are about the famous troops, but very little is known about the less successful ones that didn't benefit from the patronage of the aristocracy. It's a bit like today, it's probably what will pass to posterity is uh, the big uh, famous actor of Hollywood, but not necessarily all the more kind of uh, grassroots uh, independent companies and artists. Obviously, nowadays it's different because everything goes very fast and through video documentation, everyone is able to uh, pass to posterity, let's say, some documentation of the work done. But, uh, but, then, but back then it wasn't like that. And most of the information we got are, uh, is about the most important troops. And again, quoting uh, Kenneth Richards here, I would say that also we don't have so much information about the first half of the 16th century, but we know of an important event that took place on the 25th of February 1545, when eight men in Padua signed a contract and committed to travel and perform for a year as a unit. Now, this is very important because this is considered the earliest formal documentation of a Commedia dell'arte troupe. So, arbitrary, 1545 is the year, the birth of Commedia dell'arte, but obviously that's not the case. There were many professional acting companies performing before 1545 in the regions, all across the peninsula. So, definitely Commedia dell'arte as a form of theatre was born before 1545, but this is when we have an official document that testifies the existence of organized troupe of professional actors. Going back to the term mercenary art, so this idea of making a living or selling a product being the, the performance, making the highest profit brings with it also another um, a necessity for the comedian to that time, which is traveling. Italian Renaissance professional theatre comp- companies were itinerant. They had to move from piazza to piazza, from meaning from square to square, from city to city. I want to give you a little uh, historical contextualization. Italy wasn't unified until 1861, so very late. So in the 16th century, Italy didn't exist as a concept, as a nation, but it consisted consisted in an agglomeration of independent small state and each state capital or large town represented a new market with audiences of different socio-economical background that could provide that uh, feed the, the income that we were talking about before so you could sell the more you travel the more audiences you could reach the troops uh, could perform uh, both indoor and uh, and outdoors, so yes, streets and squares, but more frequently and progressively more frequently as the troupe became uh, bigger or more famous, they frequently performed in enclosed spaces. These spaces could be town halls, a stanza, that means room, so rooms that were designed, devoted to the to performances, courts room, theatres and purpose built structures. Performing in Do offered the advantage to control the box office, making sure that spectators paid. The major companies also, that is very important, they enjoyed a wide social patronage and were often invited to perform uh, for special events and ceremonies, for instance for important weddings at, at royal courts and palaces all across Europe. Let's see now uh, the structure of uh, these troops. Well, first of all, the actors, of course, or comedianti. 
The uh, actors of Commedia dell'arte, the early troops attracted performers with a really wide range of abilities and different cultural and social backgrounds. Again, going back to this meeting of opposites, as I said before, we have now also a meeting of different of people that come from different backgrounds. On one hand, you might have on one hand you might have literate people that studied humanities, uh, humanist studies, and they are uh, well read um, with a great knowledge of, of literature and written form of um, uh, poetry, but also uh, plays. And on the other hand, uh, street performance. And this, in this moment, you might have the two uh, meeting together and bringing to the troupe their skills, making available their specific skills. Um, actors had the great freedom. There isn't a written play and a playwright and there isn't a director as we understand it today. So actors had the great f- freedom to utilize their skills, first of all, their experience, their personal taste and also their repertoire of rehearsed material that included both written material and physical comic gags. And so we go back to be careful not to overemphasize the improvisation in Commedia dell'arte. Each actor had their tricks of the trade, let's say, ready to be used at the appropriate moment. And that's what I mean. So, yes, improvisation. But they had prepared material. They had tested this material. They knew when to bring up specific moments, specific rehearsed uh, bits, <laughs> being their dialogues, soliloquy, sproloquy or comic gags, physical comic gags. An important figure is the figure of the capo comico. The capo comico was an actor in the troupe who had a role comparable to that of a producer today. The responsibility might include arranging bookings, controlling obviously the finances and often coaching young actors and uh, rehearsing uh, new material. The troupe leader wasn't necessarily a lead actor, but in fact, we know that some distinguished troops were led by actresses. And then we have this, the figure of the Corago. So in Commedia dell'Arte, the troops uh, didn't have, as I said, playwright and director, but um, because in Commedia, in, in Commedia dell'Arte we have scenari, which are not written plays, but they are structure. Mm, they tell us what happens in the scenes, but we don't have a written play. But the company might have had a, a corago, that means more someone that orchestrates the overall performance. Look at the choreography, so the movement and the composition on stage. Crucial for the success of the troops were actresses. Uh, they became uh, members of the company's from the 1560s onward, at least from obviously the documentation available to us. Actresses were widely followed not only by the populace, but also by the elite. Actresses and actors could perform both improvised and premeditated comedies. So uh, actors were really versatile. So it's not true that the comedy the latte actors were doing only comedy the latte and they were playing only that character for the rest of their life. They actually performed whatever they could perform. And often they were performing written plays. They were very versatile in performing in the improvised form of Commedia dell'arte, but also in tragedies, in written comedies. This skill is, was very important, was considered very important for uh, the Capo Comico who was putting together a troupe for touring because you needed to have that versatility in order to offer to the patron <laughs> uh, as much as possible. So if they wanted to see a commedia all'improvvisa, they would see a commedia and improvised comedy. But if they wanted to see a play, they could see a play. And if they want to see a tragedy, they could see a tragedy. Let's see the elements of commedia dell'arte. Scenario, singular. Scenari, plural. <laughs> uh, commedia troops uh, could perform uh, scripted as well as improvised pieces and the majority of them though worked with the scenari so with these plot outlines a commedia dell'arte scenario is often called canovaccio and what is it well canovaccio singular uh, or canovaccio plural are plot outlines that provide a list of characters entrances and exits the description and the description of each scene 
They are often structured in three acts with a prologue and an epilogue. They give you the structure of the piece with a lot of space for the actor to bring their own creativity. Zibaldone, I love this name. <laughs> the Zibaldone o Libro Generico. Well, Libro Generico means uh, book. Libro, uh, libro means book in Italian. Is a, sort of a catalog of uh, written material collected by the troupe in a company book. Again, Libro Generico instead, in fact. Uh, the Zibaldone contain, uh, contained a list of monologues, soliloquies, dialogues, goodbyes, so that when to actors' departure, especially the lovers, for example, um, first entrances, exits, and various types of written material uh, utilized by the actors on stage, for instance, uh, aphorisms, maxims, quotes, or poems. So you see the richness of written material utilized by the actors of Commedia dell'arte. And finally, I want to mention the Lazzi. Lazzi were well-rehearsed comedic physical routines. Performers had many Lazzi in their repertoire and they would use their skills in improvisation to bring this uh, comic gag into, uh, into the performance at the right time. The Lazzi are uh, self-contained so they don't move the plot forward and not um, relevant to provide any information that is valuable to move the story forward. They're purely there for entertainment. The Lazzi were a sort of part of those tricks of the trade, of the personal repertoire of each actor in the troupe. And finally, the contentious, <laughs> in my opinion, chapter of improvisation in Commedia dell'arte. Um, Uh, yes, uh, I, I leave it as the last thing to mention because it is very important, it's true, but it's not improvisation as we might understand it today, like um, those impro uh, competition, let's say, improvisation on the spot when you jump and you have to improvise on a theme or a word that is given to you. That's not exactly how improvisation was understood back then by the comedianti. Actors uh, worked within a very tight structure, integrating both rehearsed and improvised material. We talked just now about the Lazzi, we talked about the material in the Zibaldone, all the written material. Commedia performers' improvisations were used to adapt to the variety of performance venues, audience types and each specific situation. They were able to embroider as well as expand or contract each scene upon a predetermined dramatic throughline and character story arc. Here I'm quoting Ollie Creek. So there was a really clear tight structure and a clear idea of what the character and the story was and within that they had the ability to improvise. To understand better how the comedianti, the actors of Commedia dell'arte, used improvisation, I suggest reading Il Trattato dell'arte rappresentativa premeditata ed all'improvviso, Impresa bellissima e pericolosa, by Andrea Perrucci, written in 1699. So that book that is written in Italian translation in English will um, give you a lot of insight of how improvisation was understood, interpreted back then. So this is uh, the end of this session and the next one will be focusing on the servants of Commedia dell'arte, the Zanni. Thank you.